William, I need your help, buddy. Or Rebecca, one of you I've left. I don't know how I keep never getting papers out of my office. I'm glad I'm married and have kids. It's fortunate. They often ask me, why do I have kids? Well, the same reason my dad had a kid, to go get him something to drink or go pick something up he didn't want to get up and go get. So, William, there's three pieces of paper right by my computer. They've got, like, writing on them. I need those, all right? If you can't find them, maybe Mama can find them. All right, I need them because it's right out here at the gate. I needed to do that to share something with you. Um, We're going to start this morning. We're ending up a series, New Frontiers, out of Acts chapter 8. We're going to jump into next Sunday into a new section of Acts chapter 9 and 10. But really, Acts chapter 8, 9, and 10 really tell an important part of the story of the early church. In the early church now, we're several years into the process here where God is moving. The Spirit of God has begun to move. and We begin to see uh, the church begin to finally begin to really move out. Though it had moved move out in some ways, in some fashion, in some towns and villages around Jerusalem uh, but now it begins to go to Judea. We saw last week it went into Samaria. And we saw that picture happen, which was a beautiful, wonderful thing, which involved Philip. And now we see Philip still part of the main story. You notice Philip kind of fades into the background. But we, then we see Peter and John kind of rise up and kind of take what's happening there in Samaria. And they go, and verse number 25 tells us in just a moment, that they go throughout the other villages of Samaria. And they share the gospel. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is this, our all call to reach the one. Now, if you've ever flown an airplane, you'll be in a, an airport and you'll hear of this statement. This is the final call or an all call, right, for all, everybody that's on this plane to board. So if you've got that ticket, right, and you're going to that destination and you're somewhere running through the Atlanta Hartsfield International Airport, maybe if you've done before and it's at Terminal A and you've got to get to Terminal E, some dummy planned that real well, right? And out there, well, we got plenty of time to get there. Well, it'll take you more than five or seven minutes, and it's going to take you an hour to get there, right? You're running, sprinting down the way to get there, and you hear that dreaded final call. This is an all call for flight 275 to Los Angeles, and you hear to yourselves, and you better boogie it up. We're about to close the door. I better hurry. What I want us to hear this morning is this. There is an all call given in Scripture. And it is one that is not optional. It is not one that is we can do it if we feel like it, if we want to, if we think we're called to do it, if we think it's our spiritual gift or not. It is one that we are seeing in our Southern Baptist Convention and across Christian denominations around the world, and more particularly in the United States of America. We're seeing the rapid decline of baptisms in our churches. Why? Well, here's why. We know why. Because fewer people are taking the call seriously, girls, as you shared this morning, to be unashamed about sharing the gospel. And perhaps it's not as much about being unashamed as it is taking the time, energy, and effort to build relationships with those who don't know Christ. A lot of us in this room, the vast majority of our friends are believers, there's nothing wrong with that, having close friends that are believers. But the problem comes when we have a holy huddle and we know no one who doesn't know Christ as Savior and Lord. Which means we have to do something different. Because here's what we know. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing the same way, expecting different results. So something has to change. So over the last year, last year we saw 20 people baptized in our church family. One of those was over the age of 18. This year... It looks like we'll ravage about 20 if all those that have come from Bible school, Kids Extreme, and Enthuge come far. We'll be right about 20 again, and zero will be over the age of 18. In the last two years in our church family, we've not seen one single adult over the age of 18 ask Jesus Christ into their, into their heart and be baptized in this baptistry. Now, I want you to know, and why am I saying that? Are we not excited about the 20? Oh, I am so excited about the 20. There are churches who would die to have 20 baptisms. So am I excited? You better believe it is. Because it's some of your boys and girls and some of mine. Trust me, if you could have had a peek behind this wall of the four, the joy of the Lord was evident. It's about as close as to cannonballs we've ever had since I've been here. I mean, there was joy, excited. So am I excited? You better believe it. But as your pastor, and I bear the burden, and I bear the responsibility just as much as you do, that we must not be content to say It's just enough for those of us who are our kids and our teenagers to come to know Christ. Because that means we're not impacting. Now, are we planting seeds? Yes. Are we going on mission trips? Yes. Are we sharing the gospel? Yes. 
Am I encouraged by that? You better believe I am. We're going more. It blows my mind. This will be the busiest summer, not because we want to be busy, but because we're sharing the gospel and we're praying and we're going. That's what God called us to do. But there's more that we're called to do because here's what we know. There's only a select few doing that. Now, some of you might be doing it. Nobody knows about it, and that's awesome. Maybe you're sharing Christ with a coworker or a neighbor. That's awesome. But we've, all of us have got to hear the all call. And so in lab, after Labor Day, we're going to launch a series called Share. And it's, a, it's, it's, that, it's that button at the bottom of Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or like all of our kids on their phones in the front row, they're all on the Bible apps right now. They all are all in your Bible. I know you're watching. You're on it, right? You're getting shared. This is an awesome message. Very good right there. Very good. They're showing me their phones. It's very good. Um, very good. I'll take that. I like that. It's good. And, and students, what's that button we love to hit? You see something and you hit what? Share, right? We don't even think twice about that. And we'll share almost everything, right? Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm a pretty private person. I don't really like to share anything. I'm just being honest, Right? The idea of Facebook horrifies me and mortifies me. I, I, I don't, people love, I, I have friends in ministry. Every time they go to the hospital, every time they go here, they're, they're posting. I'm here, I'm there, in a picture, in a selfie. I don't want any selfies. I'm ugly. I don't want my picture on social media. I don't want to look at myself. I sure don't want you to look at me. And so I'm good. Now, some of you love to share, and that's fine. That's great. It's just me. All right, it's just me. But we'll share all kinds of things out of our private lives. But yet, here's the question. Will we share the most important thing in our lives? And I don't mean sending an email. If you don't pass it on, you're going to, you know, lose a blessing or not get a $100 blessing because you didn't share the gospel email that says that if you pass it on, you'll, you know, see 100 friends. I don't know. You know this crazy stuff. You don't love Jesus if you don't pass it on. Facebook's got all that. You, you've got all those opportunities there. Here's my question. Here's what it got. Share, tell someone. So six weeks in September, we're going to focus on that, ending with a Friendship Connection Sunday on the first Sunday of November. And we're going to pray for God to move in extraordinary ways. We're going to spend six weeks talking about how can we effectively share the gospel and what that looks like just to tell somebody. We make it too hard. It's kind of like Paul Little wrote a book about how to share your faith. And he, kind of, he, he says this. It's kind of like at a little big baseball game. Um, we build up ahead of steam. We're still preparing for the great tomorrow that's never come. We're like that enthusiastic coach inspiring his team in the locker room or the dugout. And here we are. We're undefeated at this point. We're untied and unscored upon. And we're ready for our very first game. Right? We've never risked spoiling our record by going out to face the opposition. Can I give you a fresh word from the Lord? I am praying that God Almighty would burden you and me in such an extraordinary way that some of us will, for the first time in our lives, be willing to face the opposition and share Christ with somebody and experience the incredible joy of looking on a child or an adult's face and seeing them and their lives forever transformed. I'm telling you, it is the most incredible experience on this side of planet Earth. Why? Because we get to see a picture of eternity right in front of our eyes. And we get to see somebody that was once far away from God. Maybe even they were religious like this guy we'll talk about. And they come to know Christ as Savior and as Lord. That's the call of the scripture this morning. The all call. The question is, are we going to be like Philip and hear the call? Acts chapter 8, verse 25. Listen to what it says. And so when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem. This is Peter and John. And were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Philip is still in Samaria. Verse 26. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go south to a road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. And he arose and went, and behold, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot that was reading and, and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. And when Philip had run up, of that circle, that word, he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and he said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come and sit with him. And now the passage of scripture he was reading was this. And it's so important, Luke quotes exactly what he was reading. 
From the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 6 and 7. Here's what it says. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shears, it's silent. So he did, does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said to him, Please tell me, of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Verse 36, and they went along the road, and there came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down to the water. And Philip was, as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they come out of the water... The Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and he passed through. He kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. I want to talk about Philip for just a moment and what he did and how we should be more like Philip. You don't have an outline this morning. You just be on the screens this morning. I just didn't have time to get it all together this week, so just take a look here and listen. Here's what he says. First of all, you can take notes if you like to. The first one was this. Philip was listening. Philip was listening. Now, some of us are great listeners. Me, my wife would tell you, I am a great listener. I've been married 14 years, and I finally learned the art of listening. I pay attention. There are no distractions. The TV can be on. I don't even care. I'm zoned in, and I hear every word. Not so much, because I'm, I'm, my hearing's going, so I can't hear everything, so I have to say, huh, a lot. But uh, I don't, I'm not a good listener, because I don't sit still very well, and I'm, I'm too often thinking about the next thing I'm going to say, right? Some of you are thinking to yourself, well, golly, does he listen to me? I do try really hard, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm better at that than I was 20 years ago. Maybe in the next 20 years, I'll get even better. Some of you, though, you're great listeners, right? Chris Robbins, our youth minister, he's a great listener. He listens well. That's why we're a great team together. He listens, he's quiet, and I talk all the time. Works out well, doesn't it, Chris, right? I'm learning. Now, just sit and wait a while. Chris is going to process. I'm learning, I'm learning. I'm doing better. I, I, really, I feel like I'm getting, I'm improving. I wait. Now, does it kill me to wait? Yes. I'm thinking, Chris, come on, spit it out, right? But that's not his personality. He's a listener, right? You know what I need to learn from Chris? I need to be a better listener. Shut the old trap and listen. Some of us in our walk with the Lord, we do all the flapping of gums and God's trying to talk to us and we can't hear. But Philip was so in tune with the Spirit of God, he was listening to hear whether an angel of God or the Holy Spirit of God. Now here's the deal. God's speaking all the time. The question is, are we listening and then willing to respond to that which God speaks into our lives? Somebody said it this way. Paul Little, the same guy wrote that book, said this. Inner spiritual reality... Developed by a secret life with God is essential for an effective witness to a pagan world. Here's what he says. If we're really going to listen and hear God's call to go, we have to be spending time in order to hear him speak to our lives. Our world bombasts us with all kinds of information, constantly, constantly bombarding us with information all the time. It's there at our fingertips. It's there constantly. And we have to shut it out for his time in our day to hear God speak, not just in a quiet time, but even throughout the day. Because here's the deal. What if God is going to call you tomorrow in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your hobby, whatever you're doing tomorrow, what if God was to speak to you and say, I want you to share the gospel with them? And we say, well, God's not speaking. No, God is speaking. Here's the challenge. We're too often not listening. John Stott, the great British theologian, said this, the thing I know will give me the deepest joy, namely to be alone and unhurried in the presence of God Aware of his presence, my heart open to worship him is often the thing I least want to do. I love hearing quotes from people like him. He is so smart. I can't even read his books. He's so smart. This guy who walks with God says, the thing I know I need the most is sometimes the thing I least want to do. Feel a little better sometimes? You don't want to get up and have your quiet time? You don't feel like reading your Bible? You don't feel like praying? Why is that? Here's why. Because Satan knows when you and I get into the presence of God by ourselves, quiet and still, 
and open his word, we know, he knows that God will speak to us. And he will challenge us and convict us and encourage us and, and move our hearts. We have to be listeners. Secondly, Philip only was a listener. He was available and he was willing. He was available and he was willing. Listen to me what I mean by that. What does it mean? This, Philip was waiting to, to, willing to wait tables. Remember, he was elected as a deacon back in chapter 6 to wait tables, to take care of those widows in particular who needed the distribution of food daily. Then he's willing not only to do that, he's willing to go and serve the body, willing to go to other places to share the gospel. God calls him to Samaria and he goes to those most hated. Now to a Gentile from Africa. And then the Lord's even going to take him away from there and send him up to the cities all the way up to Caesarea. So here's my question. Are you listening? And if God's speaking, are you and I available and willing? Well, preacher, I'll be available in a few years. I've got kids. I've got teenagers. I've got this job. I've got this commitment. I've got that. Hear my heart. Listen to my heart. Every one of us in this room, we've said it before, we're all busy people. And if you think you're the busiest in the room, can I just give you a fresh word of encouragement? This will bless you. You're not. Somebody will be busier than you. Somebody will work another hour more than you will. We all have the same amount of hours and days and minutes. We all know that to be true. But here's the question. Are you in a place in your life where you're available and willing? Now, your availability and willing may be say, God, I'm willing to go whenever you call me to go. And it may not be that God calls you to go today, but it might be that God wants you to be available and willing to go tomorrow. Maybe that God wants you to go to that backyard kids club on Thursday night at 530 when you'd rather not go sweat to death. It's hot at 5.30. I'm not going to lie. When you'd rather go home and turn on the TV and turn the air conditioner down way, way low. Right? But God might be calling you to go. God might be calling you to go to Indonesia. God might be calling you to go to Haiti. God might be calling you to, to be a part of ministries at the school and other places where we're going to start ministry opportunities to go to New Orleans. The question is, are you willing and available? Thirdly, Philip, not only was he listening and available and willing, he was obedient he was obedient. Listen, I, I can tell, and I, my kids know this, and, and, we, when I, and I was a kid too, I knew the same thing. My parents would tell me all the time, well, you know, I love you, I love you, love you, love you, love you, thank you, thank you. Well, how do you, how do you show that? You show that by how you love them and how you are obedient. I can say to God all day long, these are the days of Elijah, I love you, Lord. Thank you for dying for me and walk out. And we never think about Jesus until next Sunday. And so then the question comes, are we really being obedient or not? And the answer is no. Because remember, it is an all call. It is not a some call. It's not for the pastoral staff or for a deacon or a church leader. It's for all of us to be obedient to God's call to go. And notice where he's obedient to go. Now, when you think of this for just a moment, Philip is in the middle of a spiritual awakening, a revival. I mean, God is moving in extraordinary ways. I don't know if you've ever been in a place like that before. I've been in some small little instances where God has moved. And the last thing I wanted to do was leave. I'm just like, can we just stay here another couple of hours? Or can we come back tomorrow night? We've had little pockets of awakening in our country. What happened when I was in college at Baylor, or right after I got out of college in, in Brown, um, Brownsville, Brown something, uh, back in Texas, Brownsville, Texas, I think, at a college over there. And God moved and it birthed into like a 30 or 40 day movement of God. In the middle of that, God tells Philip, hey, I want you to go to a lonely, deserted desert road. Now, I don't know about you, but here's here my conversation with God. Um, how about you send somebody else? <laughs> I mean, I'm enjoying this. This is awesome. You're moving. I mean, the gospel's being preached. People even say, this is great. You want me to go where? Sounds a little bit for me, doesn't it, Rebecca? I might have needed to read Acts chapter 8 back when we were considering coming to pedal. To me, where I was, God was moving. I was comfortable. I was happy. God says, go to pedal. To me, that was like a desert road. I'm, I, I really, boy, I, I wasn't very obedient. It took me a long time to get my act together. Search committee, didn't it? Hard-headed preacher, it's grief. So the question is, are you willing to go to the desert road? Listen, where there's nobody there and nobody to see you and nobody to pat you on the back and say, job well done. Nobody knew Philip was there but God and Philip. But listen, 
God has him there for a reason. And by the way, there's two roads that led out in the desert. The one that God sent Philip to was the least, most seldom traveled road. He's obedient. When we're obedient, God uses us the most. Notice the next thing. He was bold. He was bold. I, I love this. He didn't walk up to the, to the chariot. And then, but the chariot, by the way, was probably a wagon. It was not like a chariot like we're thinking of, like a, uh, a Roman centurion kind of chariot. We're talking about a wagon probably. Um, and there's the driver, and it's probably oxen are pulling this thing. So he's not having to do like a dead sprint here and keep up. But he doesn't just kind of, well, there's a wagon. I'll catch it with it eventually. Notice his passion, his fervor. That he's so bold, he goes approaches this royal caravan, probably with other people around, other attendants. And this guy was a big time deal. He was a secretary of the treasury, basically. We like, like to put it. I mean, he controlled a massive amount of money. Uh, this, this guy was from Ethiopia. Now, not modern day Ethiopia, more like where Sudan is now, south of Egypt. It's often called Nubia, was what it was called then. It had a thriving uh, 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 area there, south of Egypt, from about 6 BC to, I think, 6 or 8 or 10 AD, somewhere in there. Philip is bold. He opens his eyes and he sees and he just doesn't go, you know what, I'll get there one day. I'll get there tomorrow. I'm a little tired. I'm, I'm kind of worn out from somehow I miraculously got transported, I don't know how, from Samaria all the way down here to Gaza. And he's bold. He walks right up to this guy, a Gentile no less, a eunuch by title, and also physically he was a eunuch. So this is a guy who he's approaching who is of royalty, but a guy who was a, a God-fearer, a, a, maybe even a God-worshipper, but he could not become a Jewish proselyte because he was a eunuch and because he was a Gentile. So he could not even worship fully in the temple. But yet he had come to Jerusalem hundreds and hundreds of miles seeking God. But he had left with more questions than answers, it appears. And yet, bold Philip. Let me ask you a question. Who in your life in your realm and sphere of influence, needs you to be bold and speak into their lives. I saw a video, I don't know, six or eight months ago, maybe a year ago, uh, the guy, the magician guys, the pen and teller. Penn's the guy who talks all the time. Teller's the guy who listens, by the way. And Penn, you know, I think I said that right. I don't know where that guy's name is. But the guy is an avowed atheist. You may have seen the video clip. There's a guy, he says, who'd been sitting outside of his dressing room, coming to his shows, and been given to a Bible. And here's what he says. Though I'm an atheist, I would expect if a person was a believer, a Christian, and they really believed that I was going to die and spend eternity in hell, that they would be bold enough, no matter how offended I would be, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with me. That's what an atheist said. Now, he's not become a believer yet that I know of, but he was so moved and touched by this guy but he shared a video on YouTube. Here's the question. Who needs you to be bold in their lives? In your family? In your circle of friends? Who needs you to be bold? To cross barriers. Racial barriers. International barriers. We're in this raging debate now in our country about Muslims and Hispanics and all this kind of stuff is happening. But here's the bottom line. Regardless of where your stance falls politically and all how all that pl plays out for you, every person, God has, listened to me, God has brought the nations to our country. There are people going to USM and William Carey who are from closed countries that a missionary cannot go. And do we grab the opportunities that God has given us? To be bold. Notice this, these next couple, very quickly. He was engaged. Our vision team is working through kind of a refining of our vision statement. One of the words we've come up with potentially is this word engaged. This word really grabbed me. The word engaged to me means I am fully focused and zoned in. I'm not kind of like kind of over here. Kind of like, well, yeah, over here. I mean, I am dead center. I am eye to eye, nose to nose, knee to knee, toe to toe. I mean, I am, I am there. It's got all my attention, all my passion, all my focus. Philip was engaged to share the gospel with this guy. So bold, and he, and he was so engaged that he saw what the guy was doing. Notice he doesn't run up to him and say, hey, dude, you're going to die and go to hell if you don't know Jesus. Did you notice that? He didn't get his Bible and start waving it around and saying, Oh, wait, if you go any further, you're going to die and go to hell. Turn or burn. Right? Didn't have a big old placard out there on the side of the road of the Gaza Strip saying, If you want to know Jesus, ask me. Right? What does he do? He says, What are you reading? 
Because the guy was reading out loud. Very common practice that day for people to read out loud. That's what they did. And so he had somehow, this guy had enough money, he had purchased a scroll of Isaiah, which had to have cost a lot of money, especially for a Gentile to purchase. He buys his scroll of Isaiah. He's reading it and doesn't understand what he's reading. So here's the kicker. When you're sharing the gospel with people, find some way to connect where they are to the gospel. I'll never forget one day I was on a, did a faith training. It's been years ago, and, um, and it's one that pops in my mind. And uh, we did this faith training, learned the gospel, how to share faith, and um, F-A-I-T-H on your fingers and all the scriptures that go with it. Well, we went to training. We had two days to learn this brand new thing while sitting in a class all day long. And the next night, the third night, you get to go out and share, right? So we, they group us up randomly, you know. And so it's me and about seven or eight of the lay people. We get around the group. Now, why they do this is beyond me. I mean, I, I know why, but, but it was not fair. So everybody goes around, tell us your name, what church you go to, and what you do for a living. Everybody goes around, I'm this, I'm this, I do this, I'm a teacher, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer. And it, I'm... I'm uh, I want to just mumble because I knew what was coming next. I knew what was coming next. We're, we're going out to visit, okay? Y'all, y'all know what's coming next? So I'm like, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a, teacher, I'm a teacher, you know. What do you teach? You're a student. You're a student minister? Yeah. Oh, good. You can share first. I'm like going, back, back. No, no, no. Y'all are going to share first. That's not fair. Always expect the preacher to share. We can't. We don't know it very well. You have to know it already because you're a preacher. Well, of course I do. I just have this supersonic sense to memorize something because I'm a preacher. Not. So we go to this couple of houses, right? And talk about being bold, right? So I'm bold, right? I'm knocking going, oh, God, please let anybody be here. Please, please, please. I don't know this F-A-I-T-H thing. I'm like, I'm going to default to the Roman road or I'm going to ABCs. I'm going to one of those because I know those. Faith, I don't know so well. We go to a house. We walk down the road, and, you know, and it's kind of like Russian roulette. You know, it's like throwing the, the dice at the, at the casino. You're kind of knocking the doors, and it's, oh, they're not there. Oh, it's your turn. You're next, you know. And you're walking up. Mm. Oh, God, let them be there. It'll be their turn this year, right? We walk up this last house. We're wrapping up. There's a boat in the front yard, and we knock on the door, and sure enough, here comes a teenager, 17 years old. His dad comes out. It's a boat there. So I'm, 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 it's, this is in Shreveport, Louisiana. I'm from Mississippi. I've lived in Baton Rouge for maybe two years. I don't know anything about Louisiana. Culturally, where, where, we just don't know a lot yet. Don't know these people from Adam's house cat. They don't know me. There's just four or five people out here. There's a couple people standing in the street, and they're standing there staring at them. You know, it's kind of awkward, a little weird. And so I'm here to share. Hey, I'm from a Broadmoor Baptist Church, the church we were, and just want to share with you and kind of ask you a couple of questions and ask them some questions. And then God just like, there's a fishing boat. Jesus was a fisher of men. So man, we talked about fishing. Now look, I am a terrible, my wife's a great fisherman. I'm not. I, I, just, I, I could never fish again. I'd be very happy. I don't mind fishing. My idea of fishing fun is going to a fish hatchery and throwing in the, the hook and getting one every time. That's my idea of fishing. This idea of fishing for hours on the end, I can do something else more exciting than that, right? But I knew enough to talk about fishing and a boat and a big motor and a nice boat. It's a really nice boat. We're talking about the boat. We're talking about fishing. And boy, then from right there, I dovetail in to something that they knew. And it wasn't awkward. It wasn't weird. I said, can I tell you about somebody who was one of the greatest fishermen ever? And they're like, the greatest fisherman ever? Yeah. He's like a bass master's champion. You know I mean? He's like, better than that. He's even better than that. A natural conversation. That's what Philip does. So sometimes we make sharing Jesus so difficult and so weird and so awkward. When all we got to do is just make a common connection to who they are and where they are that connects it to the gospel. He's engaged. Notice this. He's eager to share the gospel. Here's a great question to ask ourselves. Are, are you excited? Do you, do, you, do you think when you get up in the morning or in the daytime, I would love to have the opportunity to share Jesus with somebody? I would love to see somebody's eternity forever changed. Or do we ever think about it? Can I encourage you? Would you be like Philip? Would you be like the call that Jesus has for us to be saying, God, I want to have that eagerness, that burden to share, that, that call to go. Philip was eager to share the good news. Notice this as well. He was able to explain the gospel. First Peter reminds us we need to be ready to, be a, ready to share a defense of the gospel. Can you share the gospel? Some are going, uh-oh, well, I'm, I'm out then because I can't do that. Listen to me. If you've been coming to this church for at least six weeks, you can share the gospel. I'll prove it to you. You ready for this? Watch this. A stands for what? 
out loud. Let's do this together. This is audience participation. I'll tell you ahead of time. All right, it's summer and it's hot. All right, A stands for what of the ABCs? Admit. The second A is second A. That, that will not work, students. A, a, ask does not start with B, believe. All right, that's good. The B, you got the B. So it's admit and ask because I add an extra one. That's so why I'll give you a little extra credit. The B is for believe, right? Believe what? Jesus is the Son of God, right? C is to confess Him as Savior and commit to Him as Lord. You know how to share the gospel. Preacher, have you been meaning to do that and sharing that every week? You better believe I have. Why? Because I'm simple-minded. I can't remember F-A-I-T-H and the turn here and there and go there. I can't remember all that. But I got to ABCs. And most people, they're, they're pretty simple people like me and you. ABCs will be good enough. It shares the gospel. There's scriptures that go along with that. Don't tell me. I don't want to hear that. There are no excuses there. I don't know how to share the gospel. Yes, you do. You tell them your story and you tell them the ABCs. Able to explain the gospel. Listen, he's reading Isaiah chapter 30, uh, 53. What greater passage could God of the universe brought for Philip to be able to share? It's about the suffering servant. It's about Jesus coming to die for a sinner like me and you and like him. So the Bible says he begins preaching from that point in Isaiah. And then in my line, I take it this translation, runs straight to the cross and shares the gospel of Jesus with him. And now he came and died and he rose again so that this Ethiopian eunuch could have eternal life. He He could find what he'd been looking for. Notice what he tells him. Listen, Jesus wasn't asking his followers to die for him. And Jesus didn't say, I'm going to die with you. Jesus says, I'm going to die for you. Name another religious leader who's ever done that. Now, what we do know is the backside of that story is, oh, yes, Jesus does ask us to give our lives because he says, you want to follow me, you've got to take up your cross daily, deny yourself, and follow me. You accept the free gift of God, we give him our lives, and he is Lord. Notice the last ones quickly. A certain to draw the net. You got to be certain to draw the net. What do I mean by that? Well, again, I'm a little bit up about fishing. I know just a little bit. There's those nets. You throw them out into the water, right? And there's a moment where you pull that cord, right? And the net at the bottom closes in. Here's what we miss sometimes sharing the gospel is drawing the net, right? Coming to a place, watch this, to a point of decision, Okay? This is where we get worried, we get a little nervous, we kind of share the gospel, we're going like, okay, if you ever want to know about that, just kind of would you call me or email me, and, um, and I'm out of here. See? <laughs> right? We kind of like melt into a puddle and kind of melt away, right? Now listen, this is the point where we draw the net and we say, listen, you've heard what I've shared. Questions like this. If you die tonight, where would you go? If God would ask you, why would I let you into heaven, what would you tell him? Do you know for certain that you're going to go to heaven? Questions like that. To get to the point of them thinking about what you've just shared. So then they have the opportunity, which is what Philip asked this guy. Not in so many words we see in Scripture, but he comes to a point to, to give him the gospel to a point of confrontation. Not in a bad word of confrontation, but a point to stop and consider the gospel. Don't let people off. Well, I might offend them if I ask them those kind of questions. Listen to me. Listen to me. Now, there are ways to be offensive. Trust me. I've seen people share the gospel. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Would you please be quiet? <laughs> I'm offended, and I'm a Christian. You know? I mean, you're, you're killing me here. Don't be offensive with the gospel. We don't have to be offensive. Now, is the gospel offensive? Yes. But what do we mean by offensive? It's offensive because it calls us who we are, a sinner in need of a Savior. That's what's offensive about the gospel. Not how we present it, not when we present it, but what the message is. I, listen to me, I'd rather offend somebody now and take the chance of them knowing Jesus than not to offend them and then spend an eternity in hell. You with me? Notice the last one here. Be certain of the man's understanding and convictions. Be certain of the man's, uh, be certain of the man's understanding and conviction. Philip was certain this guy. And he says to him, Philip, Philip stops the chariot, the chariot stops. He sees some water. All of our kids, all these kids you'll see up here, every one of them come. The first question they ask is this. Listen to me. Moms and dads, in case your kids are going to ask this, here's what I'm going to ask you. I want to be, be, and I love this, my favorite one, because I didn't quite say this word yet. Some of them. I want to be baptized. Right? 
Because they see this up here, they see this picture up here, which we've talked about, and they, they don't quite always get it, that it is an inward, it is an outward reflection of what God is on the inside of our heart. This, boys and girls, this, moms and dads, does not save a person. You can walk in wet and walk out wet, and that's all you are is wet. This is a representation of coming from the old way of life, bearing those sins, being raised to new life, a picture of the burial and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is baptism important? You better believe it is. It's like this wedding ring that I wear. I tell the kids this all the time. This wedding ring that I wear, it's important. I take it off rarely, rarely to do illustrations like this. And occasionally I fumble with it on occasions. Not as much as I used to. I'm getting better because I get fussed every time I do that. And so, so I don't do that very often. I take this ring off. If I take this ring off and I ask the boys and girls, am I still married? So moms and dads, am I still married? Yes, right? This ring does not marry me. Is it important? Yes. It's vowed to me? Yes. But if I lose it, would I be devastated? Yes. But I made a commitment to my wife on February the 16th, 2002. Let's make sure that's right. I said that real boldly. <laughs> I went out there on a limb. 2002, in front of Stephen Trammell and Greg Bath, in front of about 950 of our closest and best friends right there at Florida Boulevard Baptist Church in front of God is my witness, my mom and dad, her mom and dad, my brothers and her sisters in front of all of my church family. And I said to her in front of God, I do for the rest of my life. I almost passed out when I said it. Because I'm thinking to myself, there ain't no way nobody's going to put up with me for the rest of my life. She's going to bail one day. Just kidding, I wasn't thinking that. That's what makes me married. It's that profession and that commitment and that vow. So Philip is making sure the guy is saying, well, let's be baptized. And he says, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before we get baptized, I need to ask you a question. Now, we do note in this, in a lot of your Bibles, if you have an NIV, this verse is not even in your Bibles, okay? If you have a New American Standard, a different translation, it's in parentheses, meaning this, it was in a later text, it's not in the earliest and most reliable manuscripts, this verse is not there, it's added. Nothing wrong with it being added because it's a good verse, it's, it gives clarity because we find later that there was a confession of faith that was added to Christianity and to the church to make certain people weren't just getting dunked for the heck of it. They were actually genuinely meaning, I have professed Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That's the difference. Now listen to me. It wasn't just I believe and that's it. Listen carefully. It wasn't I believe and that's it. It is I believe and it changed my life. We talked about this last week and I'm going to blow through these, I promise. And here they are and we're done. Here's, here's what it says. What does a true conversion look like? Last week we talked about it. I know I'm chosen, I'm called. Folks, the God of the universe orchestrated all this stuff in this Ethiopian eunuch. There's still not enough time to tell you all that he orchestrated, but just think about all that God put together for this one guy to know Jesus. Folks, if God could do that for the Ethiopian eunuch, listen to me, he can do it for you if you're in this building. He could do it for your friend. Who knows if God didn't prepare you to be that testimony because it's probably not going to be your preacher to win your friend to Jesus. It'll be his friend or her friend to win them to Jesus. I understand I'm chosen, I'm called. Secondly, I consider the cost of the cross. The Ethiopian eunuch understood that he was a sinner. He understood that all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Everyone do his own way. I'm convinced of my sin and convicted over my sin. I then confess Jesus as Savior and choose to follow him as Lord. I seed, I give control to the Holy Spirit. I am converted and changed. I am committed and continue in the faith. I am commissioned to go. I am certain of my salvation. According to Arrhenius, one of the early church fathers, he says that this guy goes back to his country and becomes the first missionary to Africa. And in reality, the gospel goes to Africa before it ever goes to Europe. Paul wasn't even a believer yet. How about that? In October of 1857... J. Hudson Taylor, one of the greatest missionaries who've ever lived, was in Ningpo, China. He had led a man by the name of Mr. Nye to Christ. The man was overjoyed and wanted to share his faith with others. Mr. Nye asked this penetrating question. Listen to me. How long have you had the good tidings, the gospel, in England? 
Taylor acknowledged that England had known the gospel for many centuries. My father died seeking the truth, said Mr. Knight. Why didn't you come sooner? Taylor had no answer to that penetrating question. It leads us to this. How long have you known the gospel? And when have you shared it? And who in your sphere of influence would ask you, you've known all this time and you've never shared with me the most important thing. And listen to me, statistics tell us that overwhelming majorities, when asked, not, not as much the cold call, going on boards, you don't even know any somebody. Talking in your sphere of influence, people you need to begin to either know or you already know. They're waiting many times for somebody just to share the gospel. The question is this, will we hear the all call to reach the one? In this room this morning, including boys and girls, moms and dads and teenagers, there are how many, Jake? 287. Are you sure? <laughs> I'll ask that question. 287 of you in this room. Let's just, let's just go low ball here. Unpreacher estimate. Not 287. Not even 187. What if just 50 of us out of 287 decided to share with just one this year? 50. We need a couple extra people baptized. My arm would break. That's the picture I want you to see. Engaging people with the hope of the gospel to see lives transformed. Would you pray?